Ah, ha, ha. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. All right, this is a review of thermal physics, which gets into heat and temperature and all that. The thing about thermal physics, it's pretty easy to understand the topic if you think about it in terms of gas molecules moving around. So faster molecules have a higher temperature because they have more kinetic energy. So as long as you can kind of relate the movement of actual individual gas molecules to all the concepts in thermal physics, it's not that hard of a topic. If you just try to memorize all the formulas instead of trying to think about what's going on conceptually, you're going to have a bad time. So this is thermal physics. It's about the movement of gas molecules. And let's go. So intuitively, you probably know that there's a pretty direct relationship between speed and temperature. So something at low temperature, like ice, is not really moving a lot. Or something at high temperature, like boiling water, is moving pretty fast. And that's because every object is made up of smaller particles or molecules. And those molecules are moving in any object. Those molecules can't stop moving. You know, there's a theoretical temperature called zero degrees Kelvin where everything stops moving. Um, if you've taken physics too, which you have, you know that that's impossible due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So all those molecules are moving at different speeds. There is a sort of average speed of those particles. So they have an average kinetic energy. And temperature itself is just basically a direct measurement of that kinetic energy of those molecules. The formula that relates temperature and kinetic energy is that the average kinetic energy, that's big K, is 3 halves, and then it's this variable here, K sub B, times the temperature. So if you look at this formula, this says that the kinetic energy K, it is directly proportional to temperature because as K goes up, temperature is going to go up by the same exact factor. So if I double the kinetic energy, for example, the temperature would also double. So they are directly proportional here. Now, a couple things about this formula. Uh, this temperature, this is the temperature in Kelvin. And if you don't know Kelvin that well, the temperature in Kelvin is the temperature in Celsius plus 273. And this constant here, Kb, that's called the Boltzmann constant. The math behind this constant is a little bit beyond the scope of e-physics. We're not going to go into too much what it is, um, but it's a constant equal to 1.38 times 10 to the 23rd. And the units are joules per Kelvin. And that relates average kinetic energy to temperature. Now, all the different particles in the substance are going to have different speeds. So they're not all going to have the same exact kinetic energy, but that's a measure of the average. And you can actually use this formula right here to calculate an expression for not quite the average speed, but something called the root mean square speed. So if I use the fact that kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, and then set it equal to the average kinetic energy, which is 3 halves. Boltzmann constant times temperature in Kelvin, I can solve for this speed here. So this speed, it's called the RMS speed, which stands for root mean square. It's not exactly the average speed, but you can think of it as a, a sort of average. So the root mean square speed is going to be 3 kb temperature over mass, all square rooted. So that's kind of a measure of on average, it's not an exact average, but around the average speed of all the molecules moving around in that substance. So that's temperature. It is a, pretty much a directly a measure of kinetic energy, just multiplied by this um, quantity here, 3 halves kb. And then here's a look at what temperature means for different types of substances, because in all these substances, the molecules are moving, but they're not all moving the same way. So let's look at a solid. In a solid, you're going to have a fixed shape and actually going to have fixed molecules. They're all going to be held together. And they're not going to move around at all. Okay, so these are all they're kind of held together. What they're going to do is they're going to vibrate. So they're going to oscillate back and forth. And obviously they're going to oscillate faster with higher temperatures, but they're not going to move out of position. And now in a liquid, you're going to have a fixed volume and you're going to have molecules moving throughout that fixed volume. And they're going to, they, um, the molecules in a liquid, you know, they can flow here, here. They can't go, so let's say this is the liquid level here. They can't go above that. So they are in a fixed shape within the container. Um, whereas in a gas, on the right, we have a gas. The gas can go anywhere in the container. It's not confined in any way except for the volume that it has. So 
any volume that you get a gas, it's going to expand throughout the volume. If it's not in a container, it's just going to keep expanding outwards forever. So a liquid's going to kind of stay where it is in the container. A gas is just going to go wherever it wants. And of course, gas molecules are going to be moving faster than liquid molecules. And that's what temperature means for all three of these types of substances. So a very important thing to know in physics is that a lot of physics is based on the motion from high potential to low potential. So in mechanics, we looked at high gravitational potential energy to low gravitational energy. And in electricity, it was high voltage to low voltage. In fluids, it's high pressure to low pressure. So with thermodynamics, we're looking at heat. So heat is a transfer of thermal energy. And that's going to be from high temperature to low temperature. And how that happens is through collisions. So let's say I have a container. And let's say half that container has hot molecules and half has cold molecules. So for this container here, the left side has high temperature and the right side has low temperature. Now, since these two, I guess, mixtures of molecules are in the same container, they're in what's called thermal contact. Between these are in thermal contact, so that's the word there, thermal contact. That means that they can exchange thermal energy. And let's say I have a high energy molecule, so a high temperature molecule hits a low temperature molecule. In that collision, the high temperature molecule is going to slow down. The low temperature molecule is going to speed up, and they're going to get closer in temperature. As they collide more and more and more, they're going to get closer and closer until they're in what's called thermal equilibrium, which means they have the same temperature. So if I leave this container alone for a while, after a little bit, I'm going to have a bunch of molecules that are all still moving around, but they're all moving around at the same average RMS speed. So then we're going to have them all have the equal temperatures. And that means they've reached thermal equilibrium. So if you bring um, two mixtures into what's called thermal contact, after a while through the collision of molecules, they will reach thermal equilibrium. And then AP Physics 2, the AP exam likes to look at collisions between molecules. And these questions are solved using conservation of momentum. So conservation of momentum is you look at before the collision, after the collision, then you apply conservation of momentum, which is MV initial equals MV final. So here's what we have before in this collision. So we're told that a nitrogen atom, which has a mass of 7m, is moving to the right with a speed of v. And it collides perfectly and elastically. So that's a physics one word. Perfectly and elastically means they stick together. And it collides with an oxygen atom of um, mass of 16m, moving at a speed of v over 2 to the left. So the fact that it's left is important because momentum is a vector quantity, so we have to account for direction. And afterwards, they're going to stick together. So 16 plus 7 is 23, so we have a one atom or one molecule, mass of 23. And we don't know which way it's moving. It's moving right or left. We'll find out. So we'll go ahead and apply conservation of momentum. So initial momentum, P, equals final momentum. So before... Um, we have 7m, that's the nitrogen, with a speed of v. So 7m v is its momentum. Then we have the oxygen. Now that's going to have a negative velocity, because I defined to the right as positive. So we're going to have this velocity be negative here. So we have plus 16m, and the velocity is negative v over 2. And that's going to equal 23m vf. Where vf, that's the final velocity, that's what we're solving for. So we just go through and evaluate here. On the left, we have 7mv minus 16 times 1 half, so minus 8. So we have negative mv on the left and 23 mvf on the right. The masses cancel, and we get that the final velocity here is negative v over 23, or I can say v over 23 to the left. So when two things are in direct thermal contact and they exchange heat, that's a process of heat transfer known as conduction. And what I have here is I have, on the left, I have a thing that's a hot temperature, so it's a higher temperature. The thing on the right is a low temperature, so we'll call that cold temperature, T sub C. And what's going to happen is we're going to have heat flow from high temperature to low temperature. So we're going to have here, we're going to have heat flow that way, 
and heat is denoted by the letter Q. So that's the variable for heat. The units for it are joules, because it's basically thermal energy. And there's some distance between them, some medium. So like, let's say it's like a building and that's like a brick wall. The left would be like the outside, which is hot on a hot day. The right would be like the inside. And L, that's the thickness of that medium that heat's being transferred through. The wall would also have like a cross-sectional area of A. So that's the cross-sectional area of that medium. And you can relay all those variables in the rate of conduction. So that's going to be the rate of heat transfer Q over T. So heat over time, the rate at which heat's being transferred. Okay. Um, so what's going to make you transfer more heat? What's going to go on the top here? If you have a bigger cross-sectional area on that medium that heat's being transferred through, you can have more heat go through. So that's going to have you have more conductivity. If you have a bigger temperature difference, well, then you're going to have more heat being transferred because there's a bigger difference there, a bigger potential difference. So you're going to get more energy flowing. And then L, that length, that's going to cause you to have less heat being transferred because there's more medium to travel through for the thermal energy. And there's one last variable here, K. And K is a variable con con um, conductivity. And we're going to call it thermal conductivity because we know there's other types of conductivity, which is just a constant for different materials. That's going to basically say how conductive is that material. So like metal conducts heat really, really, really well. That's like on a hot day. If you touch metal, your hand's going to burn because it's transferring a lot more thermal energy to your hand. Whereas on the same hot day, if you touch, let's say, a brick wall, you're not really going to burn yourself that much. It's the same temperature. So if you touch a metal, let's say a bleacher on a hot day and a brick wall on a hot day, they're both the same temperature. The metal's going to hurt you a lot more because it's going to have a higher rate of thermal energy coming into your hand where the brick wall at the same temperature will be the same temperature, but it's going to have a lot less conductivity and you're not going to get burnt as much. So, okay, that's your thermal conductivity. It's a property of the material that you're touching. And that's the rate of um, the rate of conductivity. It's a pretty simple formula for physics too. The kinetic theory of gases is basically just imagining gases as a bunch of molecules moving around, colliding with the container. So there's a couple of assumptions that are pretty important. So as a AP physics student, you should know these assumptions. So the first one is basically just what's going on with kinetic theory, which that a gas is a bunch of large particles that travel in random motion. They're not connected um, in a solid, they are. In a gas, they're free to move around. The particles really have nothing to do with each other unless they collide. Um, this one here is important. These gas molecules collide elastically. Of course, in physics one, there's not many elastic collisions. In physics two, with these molecules, a lot of these collisions are elastic. And in this um, theory here, we are assuming that all of them are elastic. Um, and then this next one kind of goes with two things. There's no electrostatic force. So that kind of goes with no loss of energy to collisions. So there's no, the particles don't attract each other. And kind of going with that, the distance between the particles is large compared to the size. So the distance between the molecules is large compared to their size. That's kind of part of that assumption. All right, and now let's look at what exactly is going on with pressure in a container. So if you put a gas in a container, there's going to be pressure on that container. And the reason why there's pressure on that container is because there's gas molecules colliding. So let's just think of a single molecule hitting this container wall. Um, let's think about hitting the piston here. So this top this cap is a piston. And let's say we have a gas molecule that hits this piston. So it's going to go upwards at a speed of V. And it's an elastic collision, so it's going to rebound off the top of the container with that same speed V. Now, when it does that, the momentum changes. So if you think about what force is. So force is a change in momentum over a change in time. So let's look at the change in momentum. Remember that momentum is a vector. So kind of weird here, we'll define down as positive just so we get a positive answer here. So we're gonna have So 
with this change in momentum here, we have mv, that's the final momentum, minus m, and I'll define the initial momentum as negative because the momentum does switch directions because it's going up and it's going down, so there's a switch in direction, and momentum and velocity are both vector quantities. And we're looking at a time t here. So we're going to assume with this time t that we have n molecules hit the wall on a time t. So n molecules hit the piston in our time delta t. So we're going to have that change in momentum n times per delta t. Okay, So that's our force. So our force here is 2 n number of molecules m v over delta t. That's our force and this force is going to be on the lid of the container, the piston. So pressure is force over area. So that's going to be 2 n m v over a delta t. So what that looks at, it's kind of a formula for pressure. It looks at you have a bunch of molecules. Each of the molecules has a mass of m. n molecules hit the lid of the container per unit time, and that's going to give you the pressure, uh, the pressure on the lid of the container um, as the molecules hit it. Next are the ideal gas laws. These are three laws that relate pressure, volume, and temperature for gases that are in some container. So the first one relates pressure and volume. And it turns out that pressure and volume are inversely proportional, which means that pressure times volume is a constant value. So as volume goes up, pressure goes down and vice versa. Here's a small container. Now for pressure, it's very important to remember that pressure is based on the frequency of collisions because you have more times that the molecules are colliding, more changes in momentum, so you're gonna have more force, so more pressure. So if the volume's smaller, obviously there's less room for the molecules to go between, um, between their collisions. So you're gonna have more frequent collisions. So a small volume, you're gonna have frequent collisions with the gas molecules of the container, and that's gonna cause a high pressure. Now the opposite of that is if you have a big container, now the molecules are gonna travel through more space before they collide with the walls. So they're gonna collide with the container a lot less. So you're gonna have less frequent collisions. And because you have less frequent collisions, you're gonna have a much lower pressure. So pressure and volume, they vary inversely. And that whole relationship is called Boyle's Law. All right, the next one's along the same lines. This is pressure versus temperature. So pressure and temperature are directly proportional. So that means as temperature goes up, pressure goes up and vice versa. So let's look at two containers again. So let's say the first one you have a very high temperature. That means the molecules are moving really fast. If the molecules are moving fast, they're colliding more. They're changing momentum more. You have more force and more pressure. If you have a lower temperature, then you have those collisions a lot less frequently. So you're gonna have less force because you have less change in momentum, so you're gonna have less pressure. So pressure and temperature, they're directly proportional. They vary together. As you increase pressure, you increase temperature and vice versa. The last one's probably the most complicated because it's hard to keep constant pressure in a system. You have to have something either adding or removing heat to keep pressure the same. But volume and temperature are also directly proportional. And you can kind of see this in thermal expansion. So when things get hotter, they expand. Um, down here, this is showing a warped railroad track. That's when the track expands, that collides with itself, and you get distortion due to thermal expansion. And these are the, all these three laws are combined in the ideal gas law. So you can relate pressure, volume, and temperature together in a closed system with this law here, PV equals NRT, also known as PIVNERT. Uh, so we've gone over P, V, and T, pressure, volume, and temperature. N is the number of moles in that equation. And then R, that's the universal gas constant, which is 8.314, or 8 point pi. Okay, so here's a sample problem on PIVNERT. So you have a chamber with a volume of V. It's held at a temperature of T. There's N moles of gas inside of it. Um, the gas is held in place by a piston with radius R. So this piston has a radius of R. We're going to assume it's a circle. 
Um, the piston has a mass of m and is released from rest. What's the acceleration of the piston? So we're solving for an acceleration. This is an f equals ma question. So I draw a picture, label the forces, then do f equals ma in the direction of motion. So step one, free body diagram. All right, so there's three forces on this piston. One of them is a bit tricky. So think about this piston, what's causing it to move upwards? So here's the piston, I'll draw it as a dot. The upward force is the gas pushing on it because those gas molecules colliding with the piston's lid, causing it to shoot upwards. And then there's two forces pushing down. Now the first one's easy. That's the weight of the piston. Second one you might not guess right away. Um, it's the atmosphere. Because there's atmospheric pressure because air molecules you know, yeah, you have a bunch of gas molecules in here hitting the lid, a lot of them. And that's gonna cause the lid to go up. But there are sporadically some air molecules, a lot less frequent, it's a much smaller force, but there is still atmospheric pressure on the piston trying to hold it down. Not doing that well of a job, but it tries. So that's free body diagram. Now we do F equals MA in the direction of motion. And we say in the direction of motion, that means the direction of motion is positive. Here, the direction of motion is up. So our positive force is the force of the gas. Our two other forces are negative. So mg is negative, and atmospheric force due to atmospheric pressure is also negative. Okay, now we have um, we have forces. We're talking about pressures. So pressure is force over area. So then force is pressure times area, and it's a circle here. So the area is pi r squared. So let's go ahead and plug in our pressures. So MA equals the force of the gas. So the force of the gas is going to be the pressure of the gas times the area of the piston. So that's going to be the pressure of the gas times the area of the piston, pi r squared, minus mg. The mass is given, gravity is given, um, minus atmospheric pressure. So that's going to be P sub 0, which is a constant. Just like g, the gravitational constant is a constant, p sub zero is the atmospheric pressure, that's also a constant, times pi r squared. And we almost have our answer here to solve for the acceleration. Um, let's go ahead first and find the pressure of the gas. So that's using Pivnert. So the pressure of the gas times the volume, which is given as v, equals n, which is given, r, which is a constant, times t. So the pressure of the gas here is nrt over v. And we can go ahead and plug that in and we pretty much have our answer. So the acceleration is, I'm going to divide out the mass, the pressure of the gas which is nrt over volume times pi r squared. And I'm divided by that m, so I'm dividing the whole equation by m, minus g, again so we're dividing the equation out by m, minus atmospheric pressure r squared over m. That's basically the answer. Um, I could factor out pi r squared if I wanted to, and I'll do that. So I have pi r squared times nrt over mv minus atmospheric pressure over m minus g, and that's our final answer for acceleration. And that's it for thermal physics. We will look at thermodynamics next.